last session today. Professor literally by bring just two big boxes and a bag of pistachios I see here. So for sure everybody will be happy here today. That's Brazilian pistachio. Brazilian <laughs> pistachio. So thank you so much, Professor. And okay. Okay. maneira de prender o microfone. Hello? Hi? Well, I think everybody's tired, right? I would be here the whole day here, five o'clock. Must be hard. I see a guy eating banana, the other one eating paçoquinha. Okay, so I'm going to start with the present. And uh, I did not bring pistachio. I brought uh, the best Brazilian chocolate. So this is very good chocolate. It's called, it's called gold. You know, the Brazilians know this, right? So I hope we have one for each. Big bag. I'm going to save some here for Eliana and Simone, which are the two secretaries down there, right? And then... Uh, as an educated person, you take one and pass the bag around. <laughs> and uh, I will uh, wait you to eat the chocolate so you get some energy. And then uh, we're going to start. Now. Did you bring my crystals? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> OK. And here is my present for when we end. I'm going to give this for one. This is a kit to study optic of the rays, geometric. And uh, of course, we're going to have to do an experiment together and answer a question. And then uh, we, I'm going to give you. Now, I, this is CD. You know, Professor CD is uh, one of the best professors I know. It's true. If I was a student and I was going to study nonlinear optics, I would go with CD. No, it's true. I mean, I, yesterday I didn't have a chance to tell you that there are a few guys in Brazil that really build up areas of uh, research, and CID is one of them. And uh, because I like CID so much, I'm going to start giving him not <laughs> one, but a pair of chocolates. <laughs> in Brazil, a pair of chocolates like this, white and black, called Romeo and Juliet. And you know, it's a perfect match. So, CD, a perfect match. And now, please, normally I give it to the girls first, but uh, it will be a little complicated. So, one. OK, so uh, as you go eating chocolate, getting energy. Oh, I forgot to give you one to the organizers. Thank you. He's a nice organizer, too. I don't know if he's a good teacher like CD. <laughs> <coughs> he, he's a nice guy, and I appreciate all the efforts to organize this. OK, so uh, as I told you yesterday, we have cold atoms. And uh, I, I was trying to tell you how we get cold atoms using the force of light on atoms. That's not a very linear force, as you saw. Velocity comes on the denominator. So if you expand that, you get uh, very strange shapes. It's not like, uh, of course, the force is proportional to the number of photons that is absorbed. This is true. And I think, uh, uh, I don't know who did this holder here. But it's a very interesting hold. The only thing that does not do is hold. So I'm going to try to. OK, now it seems to be better. Okay, so uh, but this is not the point. The point is we can produce cold atoms. I told you at the end of the lecture yesterday that when atoms are getting cold, something nice happens. If they are confined. Then uh, this idea of uh, 
distribution of energy random doesn't work. And in fact, they stop obeying the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And they started to obey the quantum statistics. And as you know, there are two major quantum statistics, fermion and bosons. And if there are bosons, they can go to the single quantum state. You know, every, every, all the macroscopic properties we have is a statistic average of many microscopic properties. In this case, because they occupy a single quantum energy, something very strange happens. They uh, don't obey that statistical distribution anymore. You know, their properties come from contribution from a single energy state, which is strange. And that's why it's a phase transition. We have a real change of behavior. And this is the Cobose condensation. And once we have that, there are many things related to Bose condensation. One of them is superfluidity. The other one is superconductivity. And so on. Always you can make the individual components behavior like macroscopically. Something different happens. All the super properties we have are quantum macroscopic manifestation of the constituents. Like uh, the quantum Hall effect and any other quantum effect that we did not discover yet. Of course, there are many there that uh, is to be discovered, and we don't know. We know superfluidity, superconductivity. And cold atoms is very interesting, because uh, with cold atoms, people could show that all those phenomena is the same. Superconductivity, superfluidity is the same phenomenon on the physical basis. OK? I can put atoms together in a lattice, fermions, and I can produce pairs, and I can make them to be superfluid, or I can make them to be a superconductor. So cold atoms in this quantum regime was very useful to show that uh, finally we can understand a little better what they call quantum phenomena in the macroscopic world. OK? And that is one phenomenon that has a very nice uh, classical uh, uh, counterpart, which is turbulence. And uh, this is what I'm going to speak today. Suppose we have a, a condensate. It is a superfluid. I'm not going to demonstrate that. But uh, believe me, people have demonstrated that if I have a, a, a condensate in some conditions, it's exactly a superfluid. Oh, what is a superfluid? Oh, you know, helium is a superfluid below the lambda point. Viscosity doesn't play any role. The things behavior in a collective way that uh, is uh, very strange. You know, it uh, oh, some of the physical law that we apply for, uh, for the, the physics of the day by day does not apply there anymore. If it is a superconductor, it loses resistance because the conduction became differently, right? So I have a superfluid. I have a drop of superfluid. And uh, then uh, normally classical intuition has to be used very careful in this system. One of the things that happens if I steer, if I introduce rotation in a superfluid, what happens? Happens that. Uh, Originally, it happened nothing. The whole thing started to rotate. And suddenly, choop, a vortex appear. You know what's a vortex? It's a rotate. Well, when you, when you steer water in your cup, you make a vortex too. But uh, it's a little different from the normal fluid. This vortex is quantized. Angular momentum must be quantized in the quantum world. So each atom of my sample must have h bar of angular momentum at this moment. So if I start to steer a superfluid until I reach the condition where I, I'm giving one h bar of angular momentum for each atom, nothing happens. When, when I reach that situation, a vortex appears. Because in quantum mechanics, 
if you have angular momentum, finite, well, in, in classical physics too, you can uh, have, uh, if you have angular momentum, ma finite angular momentum, mass in principle, should not go to the center, right? Because uh, you demand uh, an infinite momentum to reach zero and preserve angular momentum. In the quantum world, it's very nice because when you start to rotate, suddenly pew, appears a hole in there. Of course, I was introducing rotation, but uh, actually what's happened there, I introduced a phase because in the quantum world, Velocity does not exist really. I mean, we can speak about flux, but not velocity of the part, right? I mean, this is a little bit strange. And in this sample, what's happening is I have a phase. So I told you yesterday, in quantum mechanics, everything is phase and amplitude. If I make around a point, a phase of 2 pi, a hole has to appear there. Because to have a, hole, a phase of 2 pi implies the presence of angular momentum, right? And that's what's happened. We have this drop of superfluid. And if I introduce rotation in some, some way, a vortex appear. And in the same way that in the coffee, but here, a little more delicate, a vortex is, is represented by a hole. The wave function goes to zero at the center of the vortex. <laughs> Therefore, mass cannot be there, right? Since the mass density is the wave function squared. Some people like uh, Landau, Pitayevsk, uh, and many others expand their life. They became famous, right? But they expand their life, try to understand the, in a quantum sense how was the rotation and everything. OK, so what I'm going to do today is take a, a drop of superfluid, introduce vortices. And uh, when you introduce vortices, many things can happen. Sometimes it's very interesting. The vortex crystallize. This is called a Brikosov lattice. Happens in superconductor, happens in superfluid. They crystallize. They make a crystal of uh, vortices. But sometimes those vortices start to behave a little differently and go to a regime of disorder that we call turbulence. OK? So basically, I'm going to talk about turbulence. I know that turbulence. It's a very hard topic, and uh, it's a challenge. If you go to the APS uh, front page, and then there are the big challenges of science, uh, turbulence is among the first three, because uh, it is very important. And it seems that we don't have enough knowledge yet to try to understand what makes a turbulence to appear. Right? And uh, we deal with Navi-Stokes type of, uh, if you learn uh, fluid mechanics, you know, the velocity and the density has relations and um, turbulence is in that equation, but it's very nonlinear phenomenon, became complex. Okay, so let me tell you first that turbulence is everywhere. You know, if I tell you that uh, if there wasn't turbulence in nature, you would not exist. So you are a son of chaos. <laughs> you are, in many sense. I'm not going to give you detail of that, but <laughs> you know, the conception and what's coming before, which is already very chaotic. But when you breathe, so everybody breathe together. Breathe. If there was no turbulence in this flow of air, the air cannot exchange oxygen with the lungs. Therefore, you could not do anything. So for the breathing to be efficient, you need turbulence. That's why the lungs has tiny little hairs to, not really hairs, but kind of uh, topo topology that makes the things to go turbulent. Because if you have a laminar flow, we all learn in school that there is no flow at the walls. If there is viscosity, the flow is zero at the walls. You know, any kid already threw a little paper on the, on the river and saw that if you throw very near the, the margin, the edges, 
the paper doesn't go. But if you throw in the middle, there is a parabolic flux, right? So there, at the walls, there is no exchange of anything. You stop it. So the breathing will not be efficient. Exchange of oxygen and CO2 if there was no turbulence. But let me go even further. The blood stream. I cannot ask you to go the blood stream is strong, but the blood stream is the supply of the whole body. You agree? The blood is what takes in nutrients to all the cells and everything. Oxygen to the brain. If the flux of blood was not turbulent, how would the things to be exchanged? It would not be possible. And in fact, recently they discovered that the, the blood is a very interesting, the circulation of blood in some parts of our body is turbulent, and some parts of the brain is also turbulent, more, even more turbulent. But in some parts of the brain, is laminar. So uh, you see, you would be dead if it wasn't turbulence. But you don't know anything about it. It's a phenomenon that we know very little. You understand? And of course, there are all crazy stuff. Oh, one day a guy published a paper in the Proceeding of the National Academy of Science that I was very happy to know that the value for CNPQ is like uh, nature. So uh, I'm going to start to publish Proceeding of National Academy of Science because I'm a member of National Academy of Science. I can publish four papers a year. Oh, I will be famous. Anyway, they, they said that if it wasn't turbulence, we could not live in the earth today. Because the only thing that mix and dilute the pollutants on atmosphere is turbulence. So we could die before. We could uh, somehow suffer a lot. Could not drive the car because there will be no mechanism of making the shit you put out spread all around. You know. Anyway, it's important. Some people say that the universe is a superfluid, turbulent superfluid, and in the vortex lines, the mass precipitate. It's a model. I don't look like that. <laughs> Please see this. <laughs> so turbulence is important. And uh, we know very little. And uh, why study turbulence in superfluid? Ah, because uh, in superfluids, it's easier. This is a, one of the things that in the quantum world, everything became simpler because of quantization. You don't need to deal with uh, variables that vary from zero to infinite. They are very finite values. Makes life easier. You understand? So that's the reason we create laboratories try to study turbulence. This is a cloud of a drop of superfluid here on the right. Turbulent. And, I, and I'm going to show you how, what we do. I have two experiments in turbulence. One that I want to understand, like everybody, and like helium. Helium is the best superfluid people investigate. And some people investigating turbulence in helium discover already some good things. But it's a big, you know, have you seen a tank of helium? It's big. Can you imagine introduce rotation there and find things? It's hard. Here, have a little drop. It's easier. So we have two experiments. One that we do in turbulence with rubidium atoms in the condensate. And the second one that we want to make a mixture of two superfluids. And in the quantum world, that is something very interesting here in cold atoms too. I can control the interaction. Applying external field. Remember the scattering line? I can control the interaction between the two species. and the dream is that something that uh, science believes is uncontrollable can be controlled. If I make a mixture of two superfluids, produce turbulence, as you're going to see, I can start to turn on interaction of one turbulent superfluid with another one that's not, and start to remove vorticity, remove angular momentum, until this one comes down. And this one, of course, will be turbulent, but doesn't matter. This one I control. Then I can start with that. Be nice. It's a dream. 
Everything starts with a dream. Something starts with a nightmare. But still a dream, a bad dream, but still a dream. OK, so those are the two labs. The idea of quantum turbulence starts with Feynman long ago. Maybe I was not born in this year. And maybe none of you were born in this year. But Feynman was thinking that uh, in a superfluid, people said, no, there will be no disorder in this system. But Feynman said, if you generate many of those vortices and you make them together, they're going to start to react. They're going to start to do things. And they're going to create a tangle configuration. And this will evolve to a so unpredictable way to so unpredictable state that's exactly turbulence. So after Feynman start say that, uh, many people start to look for this in helium, and they really found. So they discover turbulence in the quantum fluid, and they start to study. And many people want to know how similar is the turbulence in the superfluid with the classical fluid. And well, there are many works going on on this. Just to, for you to know, this is basically quantization of a circulation. It's like a Bohr law, <laughs> right? I can multiply by the mass here, and I have the momentum. You already recognize this. Uh, so basically, <coughs> the integral of the velocity field, and in the quantum world, that is only amplitude and phase. So when I speak about velocity means Something that I can extract from phase, which is the gradient. Okay? Gradient of phase means velocity. Okay? So it's possible to produce a vortex in a superfluid without a rotation. If I just go and print a phase, I get the vortex. I get angular momentum there without really velocity. Okay? So quantum mechanics works. I don't know if you explain everything in the world, but it uh, works well. So this is a law for quantization of the circulation in the vortex. So if you go around the vortex, this has to be true. This is n here is an integer that we call the charge of the circulation. Okay, one is the best. Zero is impossible. That is no vortex, but can be one, two, three, and so on. This constant here is h divided by m is like the quantum of circulation. OK? And uh, interesting, because this has dimension of viscosity in some sense. And people want to try to make analogies, but I don't, don't know how good is that. So when I make vortices, that is one thing that's very interesting. What is the size of this thing, right? Because in classical mechanics, you can calculate this by putting you know, gravity and rotation, centrifugal force, and everything. But here, what's very interesting is when I nucleate a vortex, the size of the vortex is, is, is what they call the healing length. So the wave function, something like this, goes to zero here in the vortex core. And is the one over the root square of the density of the fluid times A. A is the interaction. Interesting. I can only have this if there is interaction in my system. An ideal superfluid doesn't exist, of course. Ideal is ideal. <laughs> I need a superfluid with interaction to be able to generate the vortex. Because if A is equal to 0, this explodes. It's infinite. OK? This is called healing length. And the size of this hole here. This is one of those drop of condensates that people introduce rotation and boop, nucleate a vortex. This is Wolfgang Ketterling from MIT that nucleates many vortices. And guess what's happened? It's a lattice. In the quantum world, these things crystallize. In the classical world, no. If you generate vortices, you're dead. This goes to chaos. But in the quantum world, if you generate vortices in the fluid, they crystallize. And this is a very important thing. This is called a Brikozov lattice. And Brikozov is a very important guy in superconductor. I think he got a Nobel Prize, right? Yeah, and uh, it's a way of understanding all this quantum phenomena and everything. OK, so what I decided to do is I'm going to jump to this, because uh, this is 
You already understood that that's very important and everything. People have been studying this in liquid helium most part of the time. So most of the work done so far are in liquid helium. And I decided to do in the condensate. There is a difference. A tank of liquid helium is big. Even if you take a drop of liquid helium, it's big. So here I take uh, a million atoms. A million atoms is tiny. We are talking about a few micron size. So it's a finite size superfluid. And finite size superfluid has its own nature. Yes. Oh, dear. It's coming. You, you have your chocolate? <laughs> you got too excited. That's right. I'm going to tell you how. <laughs> OK, so but uh, this is classical turbulence. The only thing we know very well about classical turbulence is, is scaling. We know a mathematician from Russia called Komogorov produced a very important law that says how energy will flow in a turbulent regime. And people is not even able to calculate that. So you see, we are blind, right, <coughs> in this regime. Classical, there are many things here. And uh, people understand a lot empirically, because otherwise all the chemical industry and everything could not even survive. Because if you don't know turbulence, you cannot transport mass. This is true. And that's why in, in, in chemical engineering, they study a lot about turbulence because uh, it's fundamental for them, right? They, they all live in transporting liquid and mass and things like that. Well, in the quantum regime, I tell you why this is simpler. Because uh, in the classical regime, take a, a, a buck of water, go with your hand and do this. You're going to make a big force. And then you go a, a little bit back. That became a mass. That's the turbulence. Turbulence needs warts, but a vort doesn't mean turbulence. OK? Even Leonardo da Vinci explained that, that uh, he realized that uh, vortices are necessary for turbulence in a fluid. That is a very famous picture of Leonardo da Vinci. I think everybody knows there was a, he has a fountain, and he draws and say, what's going on here? I, I don't know. So you see, this has at least uh, 500 years old right? topic. In, in the quantum world, so in the classical world, turbulence can have a of any dimension, any rotation. In the quantum world, only one type. So what do you think is easier to do in this mass? Elements that are equal or anything possible? Elements that are equal. That's why we all believe that if there is a place where we can understand a little better turbulence, it's in a superfluid. Because the vortex lines are like filaments, like wires. And they produce this strange configuration. But at least they are all equal. I can add, I can see what's happened. Right? <laughs> in the condensate, the big, there are very many advantages in using a condensate. First of all, it's a finite size. Here, normally, I need an awful large number of vortices to generate. And by the way, remember my transparency? The size of the vortex goes with the inverse of the root square of the density. Helium has a density of 10 to the 22 atoms per cubic centimeter. And then the size of the vortex is about the size of the atoms. You believe the turbulence is there, but you don't see. If you go to the condensate, the density is about 10 to the 14. This brings from a vortex that I do not see to a vortex that I see very well. That's why you see all this here by eye. Because the density is low, the size of the vortex is big. So, you know, seeing the thing is the first step, right? To do something. OK. Uh, well, there are many advantages to do this. And uh, I can. Uh, explain you along the lecture why. Is anybody completely lost? I, I just want to have you all together till the end of the lecture, because uh, it's not so hard to understand what I'm doing, I hope. OK? <clears throat> One of the things in turbulence is that the turbulence 
very few phenomena in physics is so large that takes all the scales of your system. Scales means the size. So suppose I start here with uh, 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 a bucket of water. This is macroscopic. What is the scale there? Half a meter. If I generate turbulence in there, I have energy flowing from the macro, from the big la, la, from the big scale to the tiny scale. That's why it's hard. Any problem in physics that needs to take into account the macroscopic world and the microscopic world is hard. And turbulence is one of them. You know, if you ask a mathematician to explain turbulence or a theoretician, he's going to say turbulence is the phenomenon where I inject energy in large scale. And this energy finds a way to migrate to the small scale, creating a big mass behind. So how is that? I introduce a big vortex. That's a macroscopic scale. All the energy is in the size of the buck. You agree? And then suddenly I give a kick in the opposite. That goes down in energy to the size of the water molecule. This is what's happened here. So there is a sequence of things. There is a people call cascade. And that's hard to describe, right? Because normally when you do any model, you select what scale you're going to use. It's not so hard to describe uh, you all sitting here or moving. But if I try to, if I need to see the, mo the motion of your molecules to describe where you are, it's hard. You understand? Scaling is something very complex. Either I go to a very small scale and forget the size of the system, or I go to the size of the system and forget the. But in turbulence, you cannot. <laughs> turbulence, you generate the things in the large scale, and it find mechanisms to go to the small scale. In the superfluid, happens the following. I generate vortices. And of course, I have to generate vortices everywhere. Because if I generate vortices only in one direction, they crystallize, right? So I have to generate vortices everywhere. And when two vortices line cross, what's happened? This is called reconnection. What happens is that two vortices cross. I generate, do you know about Landau crossing that we do with levels? OK, maybe I should make a plot. I have one vortex here and another one here. When they cross, it turns out that I make one vortex here and I make another vortex here, and they fly apart. You understand? So even though quantum mechanics demand the vortex be aligned, when they start to react to each other, they gain oscillation on the line. This is called Kelvin waves. And the energy is there. And then they cross again, again, again. So this is a mechanism that makes the vortex line to start to oscillate until it reaches the size of the small scale of your system. And then became phonons, right? So this is what I want to observe in the superfluid. This is one of the things we don't really need the viscosity to dissipate energy. If you have a mechanism like this, you can make sound. So you can make the energy to go in very tiny scales where energy is flowing and so on. So this is the analogy. I don't know if I'm clear enough. I hope yes. But you can stop many times. And this is what's happening in the superfluid. And um, what we are, we are trying to do many things. You know, people are doing the easy way, making a layer of superfluid, and then try to understand what they call the 2D turbulence. And I, I went directly to the 3D, and uh, it's a little messy, but it's a real turbulence, where I can see those things happen. When I go to a condensate, turbulence can happen with 23 vortices, 20 vortices. 20 vortices, you can even count yourself. You can simulate in the computer. If I have 10 to the 15, you can't. So 
So this is the finite system is nice because I, I go to that state of turbulence with finite number of elements essential for the turbulence. Okay? All right, so there are many, adi many advantages in using um, Bose-Einstein condensates, tiny samples, and uh, I can control, you know, people in helium, there are my, more than 30 groups around the world studying turbulence in liquid helium. They all start to move to condensates now because I can control interaction. I can go from different regimes. I can basically have a much large variety of knobs to turn. And you need that when you want to understand any phenomenon, right? So I start in 2009, and I, each of these is one paper. This is the last one that we are in a battle to, because uh, we make an analogy of uh, turbulence with a speckle field in light, which is more familiar to you, right? So we're going to make this relation at the end. So many different things. First, you have to prove, and then you have to. And uh, I, I put here my uh, home page, or the home page of my group. So all the papers we publish are there. And we ha even have in tiny simulations you can see. And sometimes I'm giving seminar, and I give this, and I see that the people is already in the cellular phone. Don't do that, because if you keep using your cellular phone, you will not be eligible for my price. OK, so there are many things that are important. Kinetic distribution of energy in turbulence. You know, I'm also a learning guy in turbulence. I'm not a, a veteran, so I'm learning too. But there are a few things that you need to measure to convince people that you are turbulent in, in this regime. Okay? And this kinetic energy spectrum is one of the things which uh, obey the Komogorov type of relation. Okay. So your question, how I produce, if I give you a cup of coffee and I say, make it turbulent, what are you going to do? Ah, not going to do. You're going to produce a vortex. You're going to have to steer a little bit opposite to make the big thing. You know, sometimes you're going to start like this, but you go like this. You go so turbulent that you put in energy in big scale, and the energy migrates so fast to the small scale that the things start to drop, start to come out, right? That's some evidence of energy migrating on scales. You agree? OK. So everybody has a washing machine. Well, you may not have one, but you use one. <laughs> What's happening to the washing machine? Washing machine? Is that what? Washing machine? Tá certo meu accent? Tá possível? Washing machine. You put your clothes, put water, soap, and <laughs> look inside. It's turbulent. Needs to be turbulent. You want the molecules of the, the, the detergent to go to the dirt, right? So you want big mass. This is what we did. Atomic washing machine. So we take the condensate. This is a delicate object. You cannot really do this. No, no, no. You just destroy it. You have to take the condensate and do this. And it's so sensitive that anything like this is like momentaneous rotation and things. And suddenly, I generate a lot of vortex. And more than that, if I'm smart, I shake a little bit like this, like that, you know. Shake, shake it. You know the music? It's the best way, shaking all directions. So if I shake in all directions, what's happening is I start to nucleate vortices and they, they grow. More and more, then they start to react to each other, and I generate a sample that looks like uh, holes everywhere, valleys everywhere, and changes in the macroscopic property, characterizing the disorder. OK? And this is what I'm going to study now. And it's so nice that this is a single vortex in the cloud, and this is the turbulent cloud. I put another picture. I like this picture. You know, because uh, the clouds on the sky looks very much like this. And that is generated by turbulence, too. So yes.
Okay. We, we're, going, we're going to see what's happening when I start to put energy on vortices. Is it still condensate? Still a condensate. Still a condensate, yeah. You're going to see the properties. Okay. okay. Still a condensate. Fill it with excitation. Right? And uh, still a superfluid. I can't make interference. I can't make anything. It's still preserving coherence locally. But then each vortex introduces a phase. This is crazy. And something very bad will happen soon. OK. So I am not going to speak about this part. But uh, what we do, we generate vortices. And if we generate vortices enough and keep shaking a little bit, you see, this is a sign that si is a finite size sample. If I start to put vorts on it, you already realize that I cannot put infinite vorts in this guy. After a while, there is no space for a hole. It's over. Anything I try to do, move the vorts and react and generate something. You understand? So we go to the turbulence. And uh, this is a kind of sequence. This is the cover of a journal showing that this goes to a very interesting uh, configuration. OK. Let me show you what's happened in my universe of possibilities. I can shake. What can I change in when I shake? The amplitude? The frequency? Right? And for how long I shake? This is everything related to shake, <laughs> right? Time, amplitude, and frequency. I'm going to cut the frequency a little bit. And I'm just going to explore amplitude of excitation versus time of excitation. And it turns out that when I do that, in my drop of superfluid, atomic superfluid, in a harmonic trap, uh, keep it there and everything. I see first this kind of tiny, it's not, uh, you see, my sample is not uh, round. It's more elliptical type. It's like a cigar. Has a, a big aspect ratio, OK? One dimension divided by the other is about 20. So I have a, And I cannot see. This is like 5 microns. I have to let expand. In free, fly, in, free for, in free fly to be able to get big enough for me to see. Right? OK. And uh, when I shake, first of all, I see this x, long x of my sample bending this way. You know, it's like uh, what we call, uh, uh, this has a name. One of the evidence of superfluid. If you put superfluid inside a, 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 a container, which is not circular, it's like elliptical, and you start to you give a, a kick, the superfluid part goes in a way different from the normal fluid part. This is called scissor modes. In fact, this was one of the evidences of superfluid. In a, we did some experimenting, giving kicks in superfluid. So this is a evidence of the superfluid, and that's all, which is here. We call bending only. They go boom, 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 oscillation. Suddenly, I start to make vortices. And uh, all this domain of my diagram, I make vortices. But I still keep going, you know? Yeah. Then I generate turbulence. So those red stars is the region of turbulence. How is turbulent? Well, there are many evidence. But the first thing is vortices everywhere in any direction, a big mess. But together with the presence of uh, turbulence, we find a very interesting property, hydrodynamic property of this sample, which I'm going to show you. And then suddenly, you still keep going. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Happens that this blow up boom, in islands of uh, superfluidity. This is what we call granulation. Just for you, if there is any of you that know about superconductors, the high superconductors, when you put impurity, if you put, you put one impurity, nothing happens. Put a few impurities. You find that the domain of superconductivity decreases. Disorder normally breaks down the superfluid, the superconductivity. This is what's happened here. If I put too much disorder, 
my system cannot hold. This is a macroscopic quantum object. It demands a single phase to be a single wave function. If I st start to introduce vortices everywhere, I introduce phases everywhere, the system doesn't like. Suddenly, this evolves so badly that locally you have uh, some properties, but if you go a little further, it's a completely different system. And then he says, well, if I'm a completely different system, why not became a domain here? And this breaks in domains, OK? No, 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 no. This is all by optical absorption. Thank you. This is a good, how we see all this, right? We have the sample. We give a shot of light. And we map the density distribution. If you want to see interference, we slice and make one part interfere with the other, like a, a interferometer, a beam splitter, depending if you want to measure amplitude or phase. OK? It's clear? OK. Yes. I, I think, he, yeah, the answer is yes. For the flux of magnetic field, yes, they use a hydrodynamic type of, uh, of uh, formalism, right? Yes. Uh, but uh, I don't know how far. You see, this is still a, a kind of uh, turbid area of science. The high TC superconductor is still turbid, and the turbulence is also turbid. Even superfluidity is still a little turbid in some sense, right? So we still learn. OK, so two groups in the world, one in Dubina, no, this one in, in Osaka, simulate our experiment to show that what we see is actually what we claim it is. And another one in Dubina, Dubina, the Bogolubov uh, Institute. And the guy that simulated this was a student of Bogolyubov, Yukalov, with his students. So we think we understand a little bit well. Now, when I make, uh, now I have to explain to you, let's speak a little bit about waves, because this you understand very well. When I have a cold sample of atom, it's trapped, because otherwise it's not there, right? So I have some confining potential. And then I destroy the confining potential. What's happened to this sample? It flies away, right? If I have a Mickey Mouse balloon here, everybody sees that the gas has the shape of the Mickey Mouse balloon. And then I blow the balloon, boom. The gas goes, boom. So my question to you is, what will be the shape during the expansion? Do you think that the head of the Mickey Mouse will be preserved? Everybody knows that we cannot. Because of Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, if I blow the balloon, immediately after the blow, I can see the shape. But in a few seconds or second, some time scale later, it goes isotropically. This is characteristic of expansion of gas. OK? So if I have a cold gas, doesn't matter the shape. If I destroy the potential and let free expansion, it goes isotropically. So to characterize this, I'm going to measure the aspect ratio. Just divide this dimension by this one. This is an aspect ratio, right? So it goes to 1. If it is a classical fluid, doesn't matter what nature. Liquid, gas, doesn't matter. If your base classical distribution of energy goes, OK? If it is a quantum sample, if it is a superfluid, if it is a Bose condensate, I destroy, guess what? Uncertain principle has to be here. Whatever I squeeze it more in space, I get more momentum. This is optics, right? If I try to focus more in one, this diverges more. Smaller the focus, bigger the divergence. Right, CD? Rayleigh theory, right? You don't know that better than I do. I'm forgetting optics. Another day I made a mistake with, I don't know, not, not discuss that. 
So I start with a quantum gas this way, and I let expand. Whatever is more squeezed gets more momentum. OK? And then that is what we call inverse ratio. This is a evidence that there is a quantum object. It's like uh, scattering or uh, scattering, yeah? in a slit, diffraction. Like a diffraction in a slit. Narrow slit, bigger divergence. OK? Good. And if it is turbulent, so this is a classical gas. Everything is almost the same temperature. We work about 90 nano Kelvin. But one is condensate, the other one is not. So this is a non-condensate gas, goes to aspect ratio one. This is a condensate gas, you see? The dimensions invert. When it's turbulent, neither of this happens. Start this way. So if I have a balloon, make a mouse balloon, with a quantum gas inside, and I blow the balloon, oh, but it must be turbulent. Otherwise, the ear is going to become head, we invert. <laughs> but if I make turbulent gas inside the balloon, and I blow it, will permanently be a Mickey Mouse head. Interesting. The question is why? <laughs> But this is a hydrodynamic aspect of it. And it's a evidence that something has a structure there. It's not just the fluid. The angular momentum there makes a big difference. And if it's randomly distributed, make even a bigger difference. And this was simulated. And uh, I'm very proud to publish with Alan uh, uh, Fetter. Alex Fetter from Stanford is a guy on many body physics and fluid mechanics. He's old, but he came to Brazil many times. He and Gordo Bain are two icons in theory of fluids and everything, right? And they help us to explain. <laughs> in Brazil, there is a TV show that when you don't know, you ask it to the undergraduate students. And uh, they normally don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, no, no. I'm not going to ask to the undergraduates. Let's ask it to the you know, to the catedraticos, how we say here. And uh, they, they help to explain that when we have Vortz randomly distributed, you expect a quantum fluid actually to expand in a, what they call self-similar expansion. And uh, this is nice. And wow, I was very relieved because we actually have, and then I got a, a letter from a guy in Japan, I'm not going to say the name because many anybody knows this guy, and he claimed that uh, I'm wrong. Self-similar expansion does not mean turbulence. It means random distribution of words. So he agrees, but he says, your evidence is poor. Suppose I could put uh, a lattice of words this way, that way, and that way. I know, in a fluid, they're never going to stay stop it. But if they could stay stop it, I would observe the same phenomenon. Because I will have angular momentum for all directions. You understand? So he's right. And I, I have to work harder now. Let's keep working then. But uh, my dear friend Tisubota from Osaka State University made a very nice simulation showing that, oh, you see, this is, looks very similar to my samples. But he shows that uh, we need a dissipation in quantum mechanics <laughs> to generate turbulence, which is not a problem. Because when I produce a condensate, I have those atoms in a single quantum state. But I have a little bit of other atoms around, you know? We have what we call thermocloud. And these introduce dissipation because they can be either hotter, colder. It's like a thermal bath that can produce dissipation. Maybe you don't know about Gibbs-Zurich mechanism. I spoke to you yesterday. This is a very interesting mechanism. And Gibbs-Zurich explained how quantum phases are formed in general, astrophysics, superconductivity, superfluid, and everything. And I think what I'm, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but we published a paper. <laughs> I tried to review review letters, you know, but uh, you, you can see they didn't like 
but this is a good journal. I already have many citations in this paper because what we did is explain that this is a first evidence of the inverse gibbs zurich scenario. I start with a quantum phase, and now I'm going to start to nucleate disorder and things to expand to a classical phase. And uh, we prove basically that uh, we've seen this, and uh, I'm not going to go in detail on this, but this is another important thing that comes. Now, when I look at the number of vortices in my sample, I start to shake. <laughs> Make vortices. Number of vortices growing. Can you see here? This is growing. Suddenly start to grow, stop to grow, and change behavior. This is the point where turbulence start to take place. And we believe uh, in that diagram, because everybody says turbulence is a crossover, not a phase transition. Why you have domains? I have domains because my system is finite. I start to put vortices. My system starts to accommodate the vortices. But then it cannot anymore. Any extra energy makes the vortices to move and to react and to generate turbulence. And more than that, I produce vortices, go to turbulence, and suddenly the vortices disappear. Because all that phase, all that energy goes to separate in domain in the granulation. OK, so granulation is a, this is a turbulent cloud. And uh, I have some collaborators in Cambridge now, Natalia Berloff, a girl in the Newton Institute, specialist in turbulence. And she's telling me that what we're seeing is a transition, is grains, is transition, for what they call superfluid turbulence to wave turbulence. Wave turbulence is like I have this nice quantum superfluid drop, and suddenly start to have big fluctuations in the density. It's also a type of, yeah, this is the whole thing. OK, now, energy. People believe that uh, we generate those vortices and the energy start to migrate. And to show that, we have to show the dependence with the momentum. What is the momentum distribution? In helium, they have a hard time to measure. They have to put wires shaking so they get that momentum. And but here, we let expand. A expansion is a picture of the momentum in there, right? So by doing this, we are able to measure the distribution of momentum in your sample. If you have the momentum distribution, you multiply by k squared, you have the energy spectrum, which is the whole graph of uh, turbulence. And then we measure the momentum distribution, when we have a few vorts, and when we have a turbulence, it becomes very different. You see that uh, you go to large momentum, which means small scale. Energy migrates to big, from big to small. And uh, we found a law here, a power law, which is related to equivalent scaling of the Komogorov. OK. Anybody has any question about this big mass of turbulence? Vortice. No. Uh, the stable vortice has one circulation unit. Because you remember from quantum mechanics, the energy, of when you have angular momentum, the energy is what? L square divided by 2m r square, right? Remember when we put L in the equation for the arm or for anything that we believe is represented by a rotation? So if I have, a, let's say, L equal to 1, I have one energy. If I have L equals 2, I have four times more energy. So I'm going to show to you when we try to produce big vortices, they decay in tiny vortices because Tiny vortices is the more energetic, stable situation. You understand? So big vortices decay. And then uh, at the end, if you ask a question, can you stabilize this metastable configuration in a quantum macroscopic object? I will give an answer. This sample as a liquid, I want to look at this as matter waves. Because they are matter waves, right? So as you know, a normal BEC the dimensions change 
way of, I already explained to you. Turbulent doesn't change. They grow a little bit, but because of course they are expanding, but there is no inversion. So we decided to look at this. Well, this is this is a expansion of a turbulent cloud. We decide to look, make an analogy. As I told you yesterday, a condensate is like a Gaussian coherent beam, right? Now I'm going to say that a turbulent condensate is like a speckle field <laughs> that originates from a Gaussian coherent beam. Because when I have a speckle, I have exactly the same behavior. If I produce a speckle, speckle, you know what speckle? If you take a laser and you shine in a rough surface, all the coherence of these make a very complex interference pattern and generate peaks. And it's very nice because they stay there forever in the lab when you have crystals, right? With imperfection, you put a laser and you produce a speckle. OK, speckle, this is speckle, this is turbulent cloud. Of course, speckle is bidimensional. I make a cross in the propagating beam. I see the intensity in different places. In my sample, it's like a 3D wave propagating. I have to make absorption, project in a plane to understand what's going on. Right? So they are a little different, but interesting that a coherent laser beam, what determines the divergence of a coherent laser beam? I'm sure that 100% of this audience knows. What determines? Question one. Alternative A, lambda, the wavelength. Alternative B, the waist of the beam. Alternative B, C, the ratio between lambda and the waist. And alternative D, none of them. <laughs> what you answer? You're right, C. Because the divergence of a coherent laser beam propagating is the lambda divided by the waist. That's why if you make an elliptical beam, it diverges more when you squeeze. It's like a wave. It's like uh, the condensate. It's wave. This is wave behavior. Nothing I can do about it. Right, CD? Good. If I have a speckle, a speckle is different. The divergence of a speckle beam, if I make this with speckle, the divergence is lambda divided by the coherent length. There is correlation in here. You all know about correlation, right? Correlation is when things are connected. If I have correlation, I have connection. In a speckle, if I take one, one peak here and I ask, where is the next? I found a kind of domain. This is the length that is domain of one single peak in the speckle field. During that coherent length, you can say, oh, that intensity is, is coherent because it's a single peak, right? OK, so, but this is much smaller than this. That's why, but lambda is about the same because I keep the momentum of the atoms. So this guy diverges more, but in all directions equally. So if you look there, my sample diverges fast, but equally in all directions. So, of course, to convince people, I have to come and uh, it's already equivalent in expansion. I'm not going to explain this. But then I calculate the second order correlation. I measure the second order correlation. In a, in a light field, you do intensity, intensity correlation. You measure the intensity in one point, and you measure the other, and you make this division. The average of the product divided by the product of the average. And this is the second order correlation. The equivalent, in my case, will be density, density correlation. And by measuring this, we, of course, this is expected for a coherent, fully coherent uh, beam. And this is expected for the speckle, or for my case. And of course, this is the fluctuation size, as I told you, which is a, a scaling characteristic which we're going to call coherent length, but actually is the size of the fluctuation. And we did the measurement. And uh, this is an optical beam, 
where were oh yeah this is a regular bc green this is a turbulent bc in expansion so let me now make a stop and i ex what i want to show to you that i expanding both einstein condensate is like a propagating wave okay and if it is turbulent it's like a propagating speckle wave this is the this is the, the beam it's completely equivalent so the disorder because what is a speckle is any theoretician in quantum optics here it must have many oh you know how you define a speckle field You're you not, okay. But a speckle field, if you ask any theoretician in this field, you're going to say, is an addition of complex fields which has random amplitudes and phases. This is the definition of a speckle field. And in your case, turbulent cloud, originally from matter waves, what is that? It's also an addition of complex fields. Because in quantum mechanics, everything is amplitude and phase. But if I introduce many vars and they start to react, it's like to generate random phases in many domains. You understand? So I claim that this is the first production of a 3D speckle field. The referee did not like. <laughs> but we explain well, and uh, well, we justify many things. Of course, when you're dealing with atoms and everything, you want to characterize the level of disorder. If it was a gas in a container, I will calculate entropy. Here, I have to calculate what they call differential entropy. This is differential entropy. And very interesting, how the differential, this is my excitation. This is, oh, this is the correlation length. It grows and then suddenly drops. This is my disorder. It comes, suddenly blows up. So this is where the turbulence in the cloud that takes place. This is as a function of my excitation, OK? If you remember the diagram, I fix everything, and now I'm varying the amplitude that you excite. I generate turbulence, and I think I can characterize the disorder. And uh, why is this exciting? Well, first of all, people know more about speckle than turbulence. I can guarantee you. I can now maybe import some of the technology of speckle to understand the speckle to turbulence. But more than that, statistical, statistical field is something very important. People don't know a lot. This is a point where matter waves meets statistical quantum optics, I think, in the sense of uh, producing this kind of pattern. It is 3D. And of course, uh, the, the people work with speckles, we have a hard time. Because now they have to deal with 3D. You know, in a speckle field, it's always cross-sections, 2D. And uh, I think it's excited by that. OK. Now, another change before we move to other, object, uh, other subjects. If I generate, and now I want to generate a turbulence in another way. What I'm doing, generate a giant vortex in my trap and let it decay. And if I shake a little bit when decay, I go to turbulence. So uh, I, I don't know if I'm able to make this simulate. How I click in here? Well, I knew that will not work when I change computers. But this is a simulation of a giant vortex decaying and generating turbulence. Unfortunately, we're not going to see, but this is the experiment. You know, we start with a vortex, and here, there is no rotation. It's only phase imprinting now. I'm not rotating anything. I'm changing fields, making the different portions of the condensate experience different phases, and then I generate phases. Suddenly, poof, I punch a hole along the long axis. This is a n equals 4 vortex, and then it's going to decay and generate turbulence, and this is what we study. And uh, people from Newcastle was able to explain well many things that has happened. And I think uh, this is another feature. Turbulence does not appear from nothing. 
on your mind, right? Spontaneous turbulence is something that's in the presence of people's mind. Your mind can go turbulent spontaneously. But uh, in the real fluids, no. In the quantum world, yes. If I put a giant vortex, spontaneously that may decay and generate turbulence. This is very important because it did change a little bit some concepts. What is turbulence? In the quantum world, I cannot do that in the classical world yet. And more than that, we realize that uh, we can produce a giant vortex. And if we come and shake a, li a little bit, we can stabilize the vortex, like uh, an atom that is inside a cavity and cannot emit, cannot decay. So I can make a giant vortex holding the decay to tiny vortices if I don't let the energy go anywhere. So this is like uh, atoms in cavity. And I think we can do that with quantum big objects in the coming futures. OK, finally, we introduce modulation on the scattering length. <laughs> Le remember, by field, I can move the potentials. I can move this. And uh, collaboration with Handy Hewlett, we can take uh, a condensate and break in tiny little parts without going to the turbulent regime. By introducing random fluctuations on the interaction and everything, we can break. And this is an explanation for the turbulence. And now I found a crazy guy that are able to simulate things. Uh, and here comes a very interesting thing, which is beyond the main field. Mean field is the main theory to explain condensates. I, I, my time is over to uh, explain this. But always you get something that your traditional theory cannot explain is nice. So this is a situation that we go beyond the normal explanations of the condensate. Is a new kind of concept. It's called multi-orbital quantum system. And uh, we, I think we are seeing the first effects. I'm going to present this paper in ICAP, which is a big event in Korea next week. And uh, of course, if they throw eggs, I know that I did something wrong. And if they ask questions, I know that maybe it's right. Everything I told you, we just published a physics report. My group put together by invitation a physics report. And those are people in my group, except Barengi, which is from Newcastle. And uh, it's a very nice uh, collection if you want to understand a little bit about this turbulence in quantum fluids. So I'm going to stop this topic here and answer a few questions before going to the other. And I know that he start to be, you know, the organized already looking. The <laughs> but we have a prize. You got to stay. Yes. BC. Well, wh the, the problem is when you go to the very tiny short range, then there is a little big, small fluctuations in the short range. When you go to large range, those tiny fluctuations are not seen. So instead of being complete flat, there is a tiny raising up at a very short range. So you have to know how to see Yeah, yeah, no, no. People, in, even in speckle, they, they, they know that. If they go to the size of the speckle, the Tiny fluctuations on the intensity give a little bit uh, bigger value of two or the second order correlation. OK? But maybe, you know, uh, always people look in more detail, tiny little details, they find new things. So at the moment, this is a kind of wave hands explanation. But maybe there are things there that we don't explore. OK, yeah. Well, if you start to rotate, as much as the atoms are absorbing <laughs> angular momentum, you nucleate vortices and vortices. Yeah, that is something that we call pinning. Suppose I put a tiny little laser inside my condensate, then the vortex is nucleated around there. And some people, even in my group, believe that we can pin the vortices. We have a turbulent cloud, and then we come with a regular 
tiny collections of laser beams, and then shh, they're going to pin and shh, reverse the turbulence. It's like freezing the, not letting them react anymore, and then I don't know what's going to be. My imagination is not there yet, but uh, it's possible to do many controls of vertices and things. Okay? Okay.